ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. President, thank you very much for that very kind introduction, a generous introduction. And uh, thank you all for inviting me to speak on this most important occasion. Uh, it's a great, great honor for me, and uh, one which I uh, have accepted with considerable trepidation. I, um, as you have heard, I studied theology when I was at university. And some of you may know that in medieval times, theology was regarded as the queen of sciences. Well, I am uh, extremely um, nervous about speaking to people now who uh, belong to the scientific community which has largely rejected theology. In fact, um, theology is somewhat in the doghouse. And I want to talk to you about this later because I think it's important. Um, there is, as you probably most of you know, a famous uh, biologist, Richard Dawkins, who spends most of his time not doing biology, but condemning uh, religion and condemning God. And uh, his latest observation is that the Roman Catholic Church is one of the greatest forces of evil in the world. Uh, so uh, we are somewhat in the doghouse. Um, but I want to come to that uh, later. Why do I want to talk to you about balance in an unbalanced world? Well, in part because it's what I have learned from India, and in part it's because what I profoundly believe in. Um, I'm going to try and explain why I think the world is uh, unbalanced, but at the same time try and explain to you uh, the relevance of balance, and explain it to you perhaps in the context of what I think is unbalanced about the way people see science. And I want to stress from the start, I'm not condemning scientists, but I'm trying to point out to you how people see science in an unbalanced way. But let me just start, first of all, by saying something about balance in general. In uh, his much talked about book, The Argumentative Indian, Amata Sen says, discussions and arguments are critically important for democracy and public reasoning. Now, discussions and arguments require humility, because if an argument is to have any force, then both sides must have the humility to accept that they have not got it entirely wrong, and to be prepared to um, uh, change their point of view. And balance only comes if we are humble enough to be open to others. Because what is balance basically about? It is, I believe, and I think you will get this from reading the Mahabharata. I've just been reading Gurcharan Das's book on the Mahabharata, and he stresses this. Balance, what is it about? It is about consistently seeing that you are not going too far in one direction or another. And that means you must always be open to listening to people in an argument who say that maybe you are going too far. And this, of course, as I said, uh, requires humility. And one of the finest statements on humility was made by a man who, for most of his life, was extremely lacking in humility, Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde, the great uh, poet and playwright, uh, who spent so much of his life uh, making fun out of other people. When he landed up in Reading Jail, uh, he wrote this. He said that um, humility is the last thing left in one and the best, the ultimate discovery at which I have arrived, the starting point for a fresh development. So I want to link what Oscar Wilde has said with what Amata Sen says. 
the humility required to do what Amartya Sen says, to be argumentative and to be discursive. But I want to stress that this does not mean that we should always be uh, changing our positions or have no positions, have no views. One last quote for the moment for you from Mahatma Gandhi, the famous one which you all know about, I'm sure, when the Mahatma said he wanted the windows of his house to be open to the winds blowing from all corners of the earth, but he didn't want to be blown off his feet. So it's an unbalanced way of looking at what I'm saying. If you think that I'm saying, you should always be wondering whether you should totally change your position. It is a question which I'm talking about of adjustments, of not taking things too far, and of course, there may be times when you are persuaded to totally change your position. Now, a very good example of where balance has failed is in, and a very current one, is in economics. If you look at what happened in global economics and in India, when I was young, it was almost considered immoral not to be a socialist. And for a long time, socialism ruled. But socialism was taken too far. Socialists didn't examine socialism and ask themselves, how far are we taking this? Are we taking it too far? And so countries like Britain got into a terrible mess and had to go to the IMF because they took socialism too far. And in India, you all know about the creation of the Neta Babu Raj or the license, bar, the license permit Raj, whichever way you like to put it. So socialism is taken too far. But then after that, in my belief, capitalism got taken too far. What so often happens when we are not aware of balance is that things in life swing from one extreme to another extreme. And capitalism got taken so far that in the end, we had the crisis um, which we have uh, landed up with now. And this crisis, um, <coughs> was foreseen by some economists, including Joseph Stiglitz, who was instrumental in what he later called the crash and bang, or the expansion and bang, I think it was, economy. The, he was instrumental in all those years under Clinton, where it seemed as though growth would go on forever, and it, uh, nobody bothered about the excesses which were coming in as a result of growth. And he said, he spoke, uh, when he looked back on those years, of a vision which lies somewhere between those who see government having a dominant role in the economy and those who argue for a minimalist role. But also, and this is the important point, between the critics who see capitalism as a system that is rotten to the core and those who see the market economy as unblemished, a miraculous invention of man that brings unprecedented prosperity to all. In other words, Stiglitz is saying econ economics needs to be balanced between the wisdoms of the market, what the market can do for us, and the need for state intervention, which you might say the wisdom of socialism. And one male person who foresaw all this trouble, of course, was George Soros. And practically, in practice, he has shown, of course, that he understands economics. And he has talked about globalization, um, which, of course, was the buzzword, the thing which was going to solve all our problems. And he has said, an unwitting alliance between market fundamentalists on the far right and anti-globalization activists on the far left. And by taking extreme positions, they have allowed themselves to become involved in a shouting match. And you see the same point when you listen to both those quotations, that neither of them are saying that the market is all bad or that socialism is all bad but they're saying 
get the balance right. Now, there are many, many other areas in which uh, I could describe this getting out of balance. But you are scientists, and I am a theologian of sorts, although um, I'm not sure that my tutor at Cambridge, who went on the Archbishop of Canterbury, would allow me to call myself a, tutor, uh, a theologian. But certainly I have a deep interest in theology, and as a result of that, in science. So I want to now talk about why I think balance is so important for you scientists. And I want to repeat what I said from the start. I'm going to talk about an attitude to science. I do not believe all scientists have that attitude. Perhaps none of you have that attitude. But the attitude has become current, powerful, and influential. And therefore, I think it behoves scientists to see how, what sort of a role they have played in creating this, <coughs> this attitude. Um, it's really uh, an attitude which uh, goes back to what I said about Dawkins, which believes that science has all the answers to everything and that religion is something which is wholly discredited. But it has wider context than that. It is actually the attitude of some of the secularists in this country. Many of the secularists in this country have forgotten that Nehru said, when we talk about a secular state, this does not imply some negative idea, but a positive approach on the basis of equality for everyone man or woman, of any religion or any caste. Now, I find it interesting and reflective of the malign influence of secularism when it becomes unbalanced, that whenever I write about Hinduism or say anything about Hinduism, I am told that I am therefore BJP or RSS. Uh, I was sitting in London three years ago uh, signing a book I had written and someone came up to me and said, I'm so glad to have heard you speak because I was always told you were a supporter of the RSS. <laughs> and when Gurcharan Das, uh, setting out to study, to write his book on the Mahabharata, which has caused such a stir, rightly, um, said to a friend that he was going to study Sanskrit. The friend said to him, oh, so you have become one of them, have you? <laughs> now, this is the excess of secularism uh, which has come about in this country. And what people do not realize is that the sort of secularism which has no time for religion actually has the opposite effect on religion, of producing religious fundamentalism. So it's rather like going back to what I said about the economics. It ends up with an argument between those who, secularists who despise religion and fundamentalists who uh, um, believe uh, in, a in a, what I would call a rather malign form of religion, a religion which is not open to argument not opening to question. When I was in Ireland recently, an Irish bishop said to me, the problem about uh, excessive or harsh secularism is that it drives religious people back into the nursery. And in the nursery, they go back because they want to be looked after by nanny again. And why do they want to be looked after by nanny again? Because nanny tells them exactly what they should believe in. So they do not have to question anything. So this secularism leads to what I would call uh, religious fundamentalism. And Karen Armstrong, who is a great writer on religion, has said, fundamentalism exists in a symbiotic relationship with an aggressive liberalism or secularism. And under attack, becomes more bitter 
extreme and excessive. Now, the interesting thing is that the, there is today a widespread form of secularism which is linked, I believe, with science, which some people call scientism. And it's based on the belief that there is a scientific answer to all questions and any other discussion of anything outside the scientific sphere becomes uh, uh, not just irrelevant, but is in fact, in effect, nonsense. And uh, it was John Gray, the professor of European thought at the London School of Economics, who uh, wrote once that it is actually religious leaders who are more open-minded today. He said, today religious believers are more free-thinking than their Victorian predecessors, driven to the margins of a culture in which science claims authority over all of human knowledge. They have to cultivate a capacity for doubt. In contrast, secular believers held fast by the conventional wisdom of the time are in the grip of unexamined dogma. Now, I want to stress that word conventional wisdom because this is what I'm talking about. I'm not telling all you scientists that you believe in scientism. I'm not attacking you for that. What I am saying is that because of the success of science, because of the success of technology, there has come about this conventional wisdom which uh, John Gray writes about. And it's very important, I think, that uh, scientists should acknowledge this. And of course, I'm equally very much not saying that all scientists should be religious. Although all of you know there are some scientists who are religious and there are some scientists who don't believe in religion. And I'm certainly not here to preach to you, although I am a theologian, I'm only here really to appeal to you for a balanced view, a view which is open-minded, a view which respects what other people think. Now, why is it important in this particular question uh, about that we should not be um, dismissive um, of religion and that we should be worried about this conventional wisdom that um, John Gray talks about. Well, first of all, if I go back to what I said earlier, if uh, the conventional wisdom becomes what I might call scientism, then we get the problem of religious fundamentalism. And even if you are not a religious fundamentalist, and I am certainly not a religious fundamentalist, when I read what people like Dawkins say about religion, I do feel offended. I do feel that there should be an open-mindedness uh, towards my view as well. I do not feel that I have the knowledge, the right, or indeed it's the right thing to go out and preach. But I do believe that uh, we do need uh, to have a debate between what you might call the secular and the religious, which is honorable, open-minded, and as I said, open to changes here and there, and which is not dismissive. It must be open to God. And then, of course, another problem which comes up with this scientist, scientism, is that uh, very often the scientists uh, who believe in this and the others who believe in it um, invent images of God which are crude and over simple and then say that this is God, like the image of God as an old man in heaven with a white beard dealing out terrible punishment and rewarding a few with what sounds to me a rather boring life in heaven 
forever after. Uh, this sort of view of God, which is often the God put up by these people, uh, these extreme secularists, is a view of God which denies the deep thought, the deep theology, the deep understanding which many people feel about. So what we have to worry about then is, I think, this problem of scientism, which, as I said, is uh, a, a conventional wisdom and, according to John Gray, an unexamined dogma. There are two practical problems as well with scientism, which I want to draw your attention to. Well, the first is something which is very relevant to what you were discussing yesterday, climate change. Because of scientism, there are many people are going around the place who believe that technology and science between them will solve all the problems. And I have often heard it said. Um, one of the people sitting here uh, sits with me on the Indo-British Round Table, and both of us heard a leading economist reprimand an Indian speaker and tell him, who pointed out all the problems about climate change, and tell him that there was nothing to worry about because it would all be solved by science and technology. And the problem with that point of view, in my point of view, is not just that I don't believe it will all be solved by science and technology, but also I believe that if we take seriously the problem of climate change, then we might start changing the way we live in a healthy manner. We might stop some of the excesses which we are living with at the moment. The excessive travel, the excessive consumption, the excessive use of power. We might stop doing some of this and use, live better lives if we were to understand the need for changes, the need that life must change. But if we believe, as many people do, that uh, science and technology have the answer to everything, then, of course, we're not going to change. The other practical problem is that we never adequately question technology. We take on the technology and then allow that technology to overtake us. You only have to look at the streets of Bangalore to see the way that we have been overtaken by the motor car. And even if you go to a country which uh, has maybe solved its traffic problems, like America, you can see the enormous damage to society, the enormous damage to the countryside, the whole changes, the breakdown of communities that has been created by an excessive or unbalanced use of a technology. Again, communication. I was saying just before we started today to someone that the fact that we can communicate easily, so easily, does not mean that we communicate well. In fact, I think it is widely said that we communicate a whole lot worse than we did before we used to write letters. Now, I want to stress here that I'm not saying or that we should not have motor cars. I'm not saying we should not have these ways of communicating. But if we believe uh, fundamentally, if we almost have a technology fundamentalism, we will not look at the downside of those things and use them more sensibly and try and control their use as well. And we will not seek for alternatives. It's interesting, how long has it taken America, how long has it taken Britain, for instance, to realize that actually railways, which were once chucked out of the window virtually because of the excessive reliance on the car, that actually railways have a major role to play in any balanced transport system. So those two disadvantages come as a result of uh, this, what I might call, scientism, this belief that science has the answer to everything, or will have it. Now, India 
I believe, should be in the vanguard of opposition to scientism. It should be in the vanguard because of that tradition which Amartya Sen talked about. The tradition of the argumentative Indian, the Indian tradition, for instance, of uh, accepting that there is uh, uncertainty about every certainty. The Indian tradition in the Upanishads of when you come to describe the ultimate being, always having to say neti, 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 not yet, or not quite this, whichever way you like to translate it. But this Indian tradition of realizing that uh, there is always, um, there are question marks, there are uh, cautions which need to be asked, uh, need to be aware of about everything which we may think is a truth. And uh, this tradition was very well put uh, by a great uh, scholar of Sanskrit, R.C. Zena, who said, Zena incidentally held the same chair at Oxford as Ramakrishna, and he said, Hindus do not think of religious truth in dogmatic terms. Dogmas cannot be eternal, but only the transitory, distorting images of a truth that transcends not only them, but all verbal definition. Only the transitory, distorting images of a truth that transcends not only them, but all verbal definition. For the passion for dogmatic certainty that has wrapped the religions of Semitic origin, from Judaism itself through Christianity and Islam to the Marxism of our day, they feel nothing but shocked incomprehension. So take that back to what John Gray said. Take that back to the unexamined dogma of today. Take that back to the unexamined dogma of today in which science claims authority over all of human knowledge. And you will see, therefore, that it is the Indian tradition never to be in the grip, in the total grip of unexamined dogma. And one reason is because, as Amartya Sen has, has, Amartya Sen has said, the Indian tradition is to examine. And scientism is, excludes, another problem with scientism is that it excludes other means of perception, other feelings, if you might like to uh, put it like that. I always remember once going around a cathedral in England. And the dean of the cathedral said to me, uh, you know, there is something about the prayer-soaked walls of this building which no one with any sensibility can fail to perceive. Now again, he was not talking about, not trying to uh, proselytize, evangelize me or anything. But he was talking about a form of perception which is not rational, which it does not involve, involve um, arguments from basic um, uh, uh, fundamental uh, sort of arguments on the basic scientific principle of argument. Music is an obvious example also. I always uh, say that uh, anyone who thinks you can describe the music um, should go to a concert and just see the concert notes. And then when they listen to the music and they read the concert notes again after the concert, and they will see how inadequate that description is. Poetry even, attempts to describe poetry always fall far short of what that poetry actually means, perhaps you could say actually does to people. And in the Indian context, myth. Myth is not open, really, to scientific investigation. And certainly, the rational way of looking at things does not tell you, really, what the point of a myth is. 
And myth, of course, is something uh, which is profoundly important in India. You, much of your culture springs from two of the world's greatest myths, the Mahabharata with this slightly dodgy Krishna in it, uh, the killings of Bimsha, Drone, Tana, uh, and the Ramayana with the monkey girls and the many-headed Ravana. Uh, Rama, Ravana, how can these actually be just simply scrutinized in a scientific manner? And the meaning got out of it. So, myth, music, poetry, press out walls, all these are methods of perception telling us something where we have to use, I think, other senses than merely the rational. But scientism taken to its extreme excludes that. Now, you may not believe in scientism, and I'm sure none of you do, but it is the cult. It is, as I said, the conventional wisdom of the time. It is the unexamined dogma. And some of your students are, in effect, being taught this. Only the day before yesterday, I was at the Indian Institute of Technology in Delhi, and I was talking there um, about uh, this sort of thing. And when it was over, that one of the teachers of humanities said to me that the problem is that these students are told that learning the humanities is a waste of time and they should get on with their proper studies. And unlikely enough, I was told exactly the same thing about three years earlier after a very similar occasion by a student himself. So even here in India, with its tradition, some students are being taught that the humanities and all they stand for is different thing, ways of perceiving, different ways of arguing. The discussions which can be had with them are a waste of time. So, to end, what do I, why am I talking to you like this? Well, I can't say it often enough. I hope I'm not preaching to you. I hope you don't think I'm accusing you of thinking like this. But you do have to think why it is that this has become the conventional wisdom. Because you are in part, not wholly, and the subjects which you study and the great successes of science and the great successes of technology are responsible for this. So maybe scientists and others need to get together in the spirit of emergency and talk to each other and try to discover how we can bring the balance back so that scientism does not have such a dominant role, does not become the dominant culture any more than markets became the dominant culture in economics. It's perhaps up to you to open this dialogue uh, to show a willingness to have this dialogue. I'd just like to end, therefore, by one more, two more quotes. One is from a scientist himself, who is, was a professor, is a professor emeritus at Dalhousie University in Canada, and was the former professor of physics and of comparative religion, Professor Ravi Ravindra. He says, the search for truth, when it becomes more and more mental, and divorced from deeper and higher feelings, such as compassion, a sense of the oneness and the like, leads to feelings of isolation and accompanying anxiety. Then, one wants to control others and conquer nature. Much of our predicament arises from this very dedication to truth in an exclusively mental manner. That is a scientist speaking to you. And he also said, what should be the answer? The relationship between science and religion is best understood as one of constructive dialogue, rather than a popular idea of a conflict that science is winning. And one more in, uh, Sri Lankan thinker, Anand K. Kumaraswamy, Kumar, Kumar comments, a real conflict between science and religion is impossible. The actual conflicts are always of certain scientists ignorant of spiritual philosophy with fundamentalists 
who maintain that the truth of their myth is historical. So that takes you back to the idea that scientists taking their science too far only make matters worse by boosting religious fundamentalism. So, to end with a limerick, science and scientists shouldn't meet people to discover too late what the philosopher discovered in this limerick by M. E. Hare. Said so a philosopher, suddenly, damn it, it's been borne in upon me, I am an engine that moves in predestined grooves. I'm not even a bus, but a tram. Thank you all very much. I enjoyed the talk. I can understand when the pendulum goes from this extreme to that extreme. Why does the balance get shifted? If there are several balance in the world, why does the balance get shifted? Um, I think the balance gets shifted uh, for several reasons. One of which, though, is there does seem to be a natural tendency for a pendulum to go one way to the other way. But the other reason I think why the balance gets shifted is because of, in a sense, what I was talking about. Because we are not on our toes. We do not uh, realize that it is all too easy for us, for our culture, uh, to become unbalanced. And therefore, we are not examining it all the time and saying to ourselves, where are we going too far? I think that is the fundamental problem. And that's why, really, I wanted to talk to you, in a sense, about balance. Because this balance is not um, a final position. It's not something that you reach and you say, jolly good, I'm now balanced, and I'm going to be like the gentleman in the Limerick, I'm going to be like a tram and go down these tram lines. It's something that you have to continuously uh, look out for. And the problem is that we don't uh, look out for it. In fact, if you look at the economic thing, partly for not such good reasons, but partly for good reasons, India actually has um, uh, avoided the pitfall of taking the market too far and kept it in balance. Yeah. So many times in a debate, the protagonists make deliberately provocative statements in order to sort of stimulate discussion. I thought Dawkins was doing exactly that, just to provoke, so that we can think more deeply about the problem, rather than being uh, deliberately being offensive to religion or other I, uh, I Dawkins, in one of his books, says he does not believe in the or, or in the um, uh, what is it, the God delusion. Dawkins says that he does not believe in combat and being combative. But if he doesn't believe in being combat combated, uh, I don't know what he does believe in. You see, I don't think that um, taking extreme positions and making extreme position statements in debates uh, is the best way to conduct a debate. Uh, human beings um, don't react well to that. Uh, it goes back to what I was saying before. But if you take that point of view, then someone else is going to take fundamentally the opposite point of view. And before you know where you are, you are in the business of trading insults with each other. Um, and so I don't believe that this is the right way to conduct things. I don't believe that um, you get the sort of positive debate from which both sides can understand each other's position. I think one of the most important things in any debate, unless you feel uh, that someone is, what you might say, totally off the map. I mean, if you think someone is an outright fascist um, or something like that, then that is a different matter. But in general terms, I think debates should be conducted in such a way that both sides are showing respect uh, to each other. And I know from my own personal feeling, and I know from many other people, that the way Dawkins talks does not make us feel that uh, we could have a reasonable 
debate and discussion with you. Yeah, uh, two quick questions, sir. Uh, first question, uh, that the Scandinavian countries, most of them have uh, atheism ranging between 74 to 90% of their population. And uh, the other things we know about Scandinavian countries are that they have one of the best healthcare systems in the world, one of the uh, state almost takes care of, care of everything, one of the lowest crime rates in the world, lowest rates of poverty, of unemployment, highest rates of literacy, etc, etc. So, how do you explain that? I mean, in terms of your attack on uh, secularism. And the, the, the second question is that name one instance, either in print or on television or anywhere else, where Richard Dawkins has said explicitly that science has the answers to everything. I think you are building straw man arguments. I would also like to end with a quote, which is, there is a difference between having an open mind and having your brain fall out of your skull. Having what? Sorry, I didn't get the last. <laughs> I didn't get the last. I said there is a difference between having an open mind and having your brain fall out of your skull. This is again attributed to talking. Yeah. Well, um, I think in the, in the first question, I think you have misunderstood entirely what I said. Um, because I have not talked about having fight or anything like that. I have talked uh, about oh, the second question having reasonable and reasoned uh, discussions. And um, I have not said that Dawkins has said science has all the answers. What I have said, again, if you listen carefully, is that these people like Dawkins cause people are responsible for this unexamined uh, dogma that I talked about. I did not say but I did say that Dawkins talked about religious people in offensive language. Your first question, um, I'm not quite sure um, what the relevance is, because I'm not in any way saying that it is better to be religious or not to be religious. Some people are, some people are not. If the majority are not, that's absolutely fine by me, provided they are open-minded, and discuss things with, um, uh, with religious people. I said time and again that I am not proselytizing, I'm not even arguing for religion. That is not the point of my argument. On the Scandinavian countries also, I would just point out that one of the reasons they've been so successful is because they are one country which has maintained a balance between socialism and market uh, economics. And they are one group of countries which have preserved quite a lot of socialism, but still are successful in a market economic way. Do you think going back to a more liberal education will help? Yes. Um, uh, I. I I, I do believe that um, any education, um, I personally, if I can put it the other way around, I personally deeply regret the fact that when I was a young man, uh, you could go through school learning virtually no science at all. I think that is a huge lack in my education. But equally, I do think that the humanities have a lot to say to scientists as well. Um, and therefore, I do think that it's sad that teachers in, not all, I'm sure, but some teachers in IIT Delhi are telling their students that the humanities are, in effect, uh, a waste of time. So the market economists uh, always talk about growth, growth and growth. And uh, the Hindu rate of growth was a much maligned term uh, all these years. Uh, you mentioned in your lecture that uh, India somehow escaped because it didn't uh, move uh, towards the extreme side of market economics. Uh, what views do you have regarding Hindu rate of growth, which, which is like 3-4% growth? Yeah. Well, I think India has bypassed or gone faster than the Hindu rate of growth now. Um, the, that, the liberalization of the economy, as it's called, I think has led to um, uh, a considerable stepping up of uh, um, uh, 
the rate of growth. Um, the argument now really is how much uh, further do you want to liberalize the economy and how much do you want to keep government controls in place. And I would say that in some, case, in some cases, we do, India does need to liberalize the economy further. But I would also say that perhaps by good fortune rather than by policy, the fact that uh, you did not go so far, too far down the liberalization road has enabled you to weather this storm better than many other countries have done. But it would be an utter disaster if uh, this was used as an argument for returning to the license permit Raj or the net about the Raj. Uh, sir, I was listening to your uh, argument that, I was listening to your argument that uh, according to the Indian tradition, uh, we give quite a lot of weightage to uncertainty. Uh, but would it be prudent to say that we sometimes find excuse in that uncertainty? Because um, as a society at large, we um, tend to delay decisions. We tend, whether it be policy making or the judiciary or day to day lives. So, do you think in, we are sometimes unbalanced about uncertainties as a society? Uh, yes, I think that's a very good question. I, I, I've often said that. Uh, you can be unbalanced about uncertainty just as you can be unbalanced about uh, anything else. And I do think that the Chal uh, or Tikhai Chalega type uh, philosophy, which many people in this country adopt, you know, you often say to people in this country, uh, you know, how does India go ahead with the administration like it is and everything? And they say, Ram Barosa or something like that. <laughs> Uh, perhaps I could end or tell you a little story just to illustrate this, which actually happened to me on a train journey to Bangalore. Um, I happened to be a great fan of railways, perhaps that's why I mentioned them in this talk. And um, I was coming on a very complicated journey from Patna to Bangalore to attend a wedding in Bangalore. And I got to the first change, which was at Mogul Sarai Junction. And I found to my horror that uh, there was no uh, no, t no one was, uh, no announcements, no one was saying anything about the train which I was going to connect for the next stage of my journey. So I went to the inquiry desk and I asked at the inquiry desk uh, where the train was. And he said, it's indefinitely delayed. <laughs> so I said, that means it's lost, I said. <laughs> so the guy said, yeah. So then I sort of blew my top, you see, and he said, you foreigners, you don't understand India, you see, everything uh, comes out all right in the end, so just calm down. <laughs> uh, then, then he said to me, there is another train which was lost, and it has been found. <laughs> and um, on a serious note, just to finish, I sometimes think that India, because it has a wonderful capacity to survive terrible crises, like the assassination of Mahatma Gandhi, Indra Gandhi, Rajiv Gandhi, defeat by the Chinese, three wars with Pakistan, Ayodhya, Bhopal gas disaster, so many disasters, um, and yet India pulls through, that this does, I think, increase the feeling among people that somehow or other we will muddle through, and therefore we can be over uncertain. Uh, so I think it's a very good question. Yes. I'd like to correct an impression that probably has been created by one of your comments. Now, I'm a professor at IIT Kanpur, and in front of me there's a professor of Indian History of Science, Bangalore, who about 35 years ago was also an undergraduate student at IIT Kanpur. Interestingly, today both his son and my son are undergraduate students at IIT Kanpur. And all through these years, till today, all undergraduate students at IIT Kanpur have to do at least four minimum courses in humanities. And many of the students, after graduating, commented that some of the best courses that they had were actually humanities. So if a comment has been made by a professor of IIT Delhi, it may be his personal opinion. And I think still uh, humanities are taken as seriously as it should be, at least in some other IITs, and most probably also in IIT Delhi, but maybe not everybody. So 
I'd like to make that correction. Well, no, I'm very grateful to you for making that correction. Um, and um, of course, I um, was actually speaking to someone who teaches humanities at IIT, so I was I'm aware of the fact that humanities are taught. And I'm very glad you made that correction, and very glad about what you have said. <coughs> Um, well, you know, I did say that there are um, uh, things, uh, occasions where you do have to take an extreme position, and I did mention, for instance, uh, fascism uh, as uh, one example of where you have to take an extreme position. Um, I wouldn't like to comment on abortion um, uh, because um, I think there are discussions which can be had on, on abortion. That's my own personal view. Um, but uh, certainly I would agree with you that there are things. I mean, you know, the treatment of the Jews in the Holocaust, uh, you can't uh, have an argument and try and suggest that there were good reasons for that, or you can't argue with someone like some people still who try to deny the Holocaust. Uh, you work sometime. Hello. 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 You have, would you at some time believe that there was a similar case for religion, violence in an imbalance rule for religion, one. And two, today when you know the spiritual sphere is so closely linked to the marketplace, would you give the flip side of this lecture to a religious gathering? <laughs> I, I, I did speak um, somewhat on these lines to a, a meet, a gathering in Delhi of the world uh, leaders of the, well, theologians from around the world. Um, and, um, well, uh, I wasn't booed or uh, um, uh, I was escorted out uh, in a fairly dignified way. <laughs> I, uh, I didn't quite get the first bit of your question, which is that, did you At some point in the history of the world, would you say that there was a reason for violence and an imbalance word as for its religion Oh, yes, 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 certainly. Um, there have been some countries, there are some countries still, where it is not the scientism which is unbalanced, but it's the religion which is unbalanced. This is certainly absolutely true. And, you know, if you look back to that quotation by John Gray, uh, he was talking about the certainties of religion uh, in the Victorian era. Um, certainly there were times, and there still are times, and there are people, um, religious fundamentalists, who um, are just as unopened to dialogue, unopened to discussion, as the people who are... Um, but I do think uh, that uh, if you look at certain parts of your history, like the thing of Renaissance, for instance, there was there a coming together of Western and um, Indian culture, which was, in a way, what I was talking about, discussion, balance, learning from each other. And I can only say that when I speak like this in Britain now, uh, of a lot of people, uh, listen with interest and ask questions which indicate that they have uh, uh, heard what I said. Um, I personally believe, though, that the trouble with any form of colonialism is that in the end um, it is not as open to discussion and debate uh, as it should be, as it should have been. But I think that the debates which took place uh, when Britain was uh, ruling India as a colonial power, would have reached India anyhow, because India has always been at the crossroads of the world. Uh, just very briefly to add one thing to that, I'm not saying that, uh, I'm not saying what political shape India would have taken if, in, if Britain had come. Maybe it would have been united, maybe it would not. But, uh, you know, I do think that India has always been open to other uh, thought from other parts.
parts of the world, and it would have been open if the British had not been there.